the religious love to say, here's how to talk to atheists when they absolutely do not know how to talk to atheists or anyone else outside of their echo chambers. They have no real experience with atheists, not the rational, skeptical version who know the religious creed better than the religious themselves and know exactly how to take it apart. And that's what we're going to start looking at today. Stick around. This is honestly going to be a lot longer than I had intended it to be, but I think you'll see why as we go along. This is an article published on GetPrinciples.com, supposedly about how to talk to atheists, but this is absolutely not how you ought to go about it. This is how you get atheists to laugh at you, which the religious can never seem to figure out because they're so trapped in their own theological bubble that they can't even see the real world from where they are. So, fair warning, this is going to take a while, with the inevitable supercut coming eventually. So, I hope you enjoy. How to Talk to Atheists with Clarity and Confidence Now, we see a lot of videos and articles that are, let's be honest, pretty negative. Oh, atheists just suck and all that. So, I guess it is nice to see something that at least tries to be positive, and I do appreciate a little positivity here and there, but that isn't out there trying to attack the non-religious just because we exist. So, for that, good show. However, this is going to turn into a laundry list of reasons why these discussions, well, they just never go well, do they? At least with educated atheists, because they make all the same mistakes in their mad rush toward religious happy land that we've come to expect. So, I'm going to take time over the next couple of videos to go into detail and show why these ideas just do not work. And it's my hope that anyone religious who might be watching might learn why none of this impresses us at all, and why it really shouldn't impress them either. So, let's get started and see where this goes. Back in 2013, at the height of the so-called New Atheism, I realized that many young people were being drawn into this movement, swayed by poor arguments and heated rhetoric, in particular through the internet. That group included a lot of very young Catholics who were never taught rational reasons to believe in God and had thus come to believe that religion was little more than superstition. Now, let's not fool ourselves. There is no new atheism, and there never was. It was just the first time that atheists could just get out there and be honest without having to face social, political, and legal problems for doing so. It wasn't that long ago when the religious could just kill your ass for saying things that they didn't like. I don't know when this article was written. It wasn't obvious anyway, at least not that I could find, and I suppose it really doesn't matter. I just like to point out that the new atheists were just the ones that couldn't be forced to shut up through religious pressure. And you notice that he's really kind of concerned here that Catholics were listening to atheists and deconverting, right? You have to keep them in the fold whether they want to be there or not. They only started caring about so-called rational reasons once we started showing just how irrational their religious beliefs actually were. Judging by the current flood out of the churches, I'd say it worked, wouldn't you? So, anyhow, he describes it a little bit, but that's pretty much beyond our wheelhouse, so I'm going to just skip over that. And, of course, if you want to read it, the link is in the description and you can go make yourself happy. Let's get on to the actual tips. Tip number one, respect their intelligence. Some Christians think all atheists are ridiculous, so they openly mock or belittle those who question God. You should never make that mistake. Most atheists I have met are smart, sincere, and good-hearted, and even if they are not, treat them as if they were. Don't talk down to them or speak condescendingly, the way that you might to a child. Treat them with respect and acknowledge their intelligence. When you do, they'll be much more likely to listen to what you have to say. My friend, Catholic writer and speaker Jennifer Fulweiler, even recommends using this tactic as a clandestine spur to belief, saying something like, 
Oh, come on. You're too smart to be an atheist. I know you can see through those bad arguments. Yeah, but isn't that condescending right there? Isn't that doing exactly what you're saying not to do? All right. In general, I'm on board with that. I mean, I think respect is earned and for anyone religious or otherwise who at least tries, that ought to be respected at least to the degree that they've earned it. Granted, I don't think that a lot of theists, at least the kind that we tend to see around here, I don't think they've actually earned any. And that's why I've been on a futile search for years now looking for any theist who doesn't rely entirely on faith. Because faith doesn't mean anything. I want someone who is entirely rational when it comes to their religious beliefs. People who can say, here's the evidence that I looked at that led me to God, let me walk you through the steps. That doesn't go, but I just want to believe. Because wanting to believe doesn't mean anything. I don't think we're ever going to find anybody like that because those people don't tend to exist, at least not in my very extensive experience. But hey, I haven't seen them all, so you never know. Now, we could go off into the weeds on this, and that's not really the topic of this video. So if you want to talk about it some more, we can do that down in the comments. But let's get back to his tips, because I don't think this is actually going to get him anywhere. Do you? Tip number two, find common ground. When you talk with a religious skeptic, you will likely disagree about God and religion. Do not start there. Instead, focus on areas of agreement. For instance, perhaps you both appreciate the value of science or critical thinking. Start with that. Hopefully, you both agree that we should follow the evidence wherever it leads, even if it requires us to reject some cherished beliefs and to change our minds. Yeah, but how often do we find theists who are willing to do that? Virtually never. Most of the people that we look at, and that includes Catholics, they reject science when it disagrees with their religious beliefs. They want to believe things that are not supportable in the real world. It would be great if they would say, yep, if it doesn't match up to reality, we're going to reject it. But that is not how religion works. At least, I've never met anybody who was willing to do that. And that's the thing. I've read a lot of articles like this, watched a couple of videos, and they very clearly, they're not the ones that you tend to see out in the wild. I don't think that if we actually talked to them, they would actually follow any of this. Because this isn't their religion. And we've looked at a lot of Catholics who obviously are not following any of this, so this is not standard Catholicism. This is, we're going to say the things that comfort the people that we're making the videos for or writing the articles for so that we make more money. Because usually that's what this is all about. But anyway, let's get back to it. Begin your conversation on a good foot and find common ground. Then, once you have established some rapport, you will be ready to move on to points of disagreement. And that would be great and all, but I find, increasingly, that there really isn't much common ground to be had with a lot of religious people. Now, the idea is fine. I agree that we should try to find it. But when I talk about finding common ground, I mean finding a common agreement on the evidential requirements for the existence of God. I mean getting rid of faith as a determining factor. Faith doesn't mean anything. It never has and it never will. And just getting the religious to acknowledge that faith means nothing, that would certainly help, but they won't do it, will they? They don't accept the faith of other religions as lending credence to their beliefs, so why should their own be any different? Common ground is a fantastic idea if we could actually get them to give up the absurd double standards that they use in their own beliefs. And I'm certainly not holding my breath on that. Tip number three, ask good questions. Instead of trying to present your views aggressively to your atheist friend, there's those atheist friends again that we know they don't have, first ask them what they believe. This tact will accomplish two results simultaneously. 
First, you will understand where they are coming from, so you are not responding to a straw man version of their beliefs. Second, you will force them to clarify exactly what they believe, which can lead them to detect holes in their view that will cause them to question their atheist beliefs. Yes, you do need to ask good questions, but you also have to have good answers. You have to realize that everyone isn't just like you are, which I think we all know the religious have a real problem with. This is where most conversations with the religious start to go sideways. But I have faith, and therefore everyone has faith. But my book says everyone believes in God, and it just has to be right, so there. This is where these things go sideways so often. They are so used to the religious echo chamber that they've lived in forever that they don't know how to listen to anyone outside of it. They are automatically right, right? They are used to preaching, not learning, and when it becomes obvious just how weak their position is, which doesn't take long when they start talking to people who know their position better than they do, when people don't take all of the things that they believe is automatically correct, which is what happens as soon as they step outside their echo chamber, then they just don't know how to handle themselves, and that needs to change. So while, yes, they should ask good questions, you notice what the questions that they're asking are. They're not about the existence of God. They're not about evidentiary standards. They're about, well, what do you believe? Well, guess what? As an atheist, I mean, in my atheism, I don't believe anything because atheism is the answer to one and only one question. Do you believe in any gods? The answer is no, I'm an atheist. That's it. It has no bearing on anything else in my life. And this is just a distraction. We are not just like they are. They need to figure it out. Along these lines, there are two questions I love to raise with an atheist. First, I like to ask, which argument for God do you find strongest, and why does it fail? Or, to ask it another way, what's the best reason to believe in God, and why does it not convince you? This angle puts them on the spot. Not in a bad way, but in a way that causes them to reflect on whether they've actually considered the God question fairly and thoroughly. All right, I'll be honest, and I've been asked those questions many, many times before, and for the first, there isn't any. Every single argument for God is absurdly weak and depends on irrational preconceptions and wishful thinking. If you don't start with a belief that a God exists, chances are you're not going to end up with a belief in a God, because all of those preconceptions required already require faith. If you don't start with faith, you're not going to end up with faith. That's kind of the problem. We're going to see all of that play out in this article, I'm sure. For the second question, it's really the same thing, since they're really just variations on a theme. I have never once not ever seen a halfway decent reason to believe in any god of any kind, period. They're all just faith-based nonsense. Why don't I believe? Because there is no evidence. Not the wishful thinking that you people push, but actual, demonstrable, verifiable evidence that points directly to an actual god. You people can't even define how you know anything about your gods because it's all just shit you made up in your heads. This is not impressive, and I think we're going to see more of that coming up. In my experience, few atheists have actually read books defending God or have studied the issue at length. Yeah, but I have. I've read lots of them. I have a lot of them just sitting on my bookshelf, and I've read every single one. Every single one of them has the same problem, and that problem is faith. If you don't start out with faith, you don't get to believe. I have no faith in anything, at least not in the Hebrews 11 one sense. I have well-reasoned, well-evidenced trust in things that I have seen for myself. But the religious, they just can't get there with their gods. They just insist that it has to be true because it gives them an emotional woody. And I don't do that. I don't care about feelings. I care about facts. And that's why I have not been convinced of any of the things that they claim. And they can't get that through their heads, can they? Therefore, 
they'll usually respond by referencing a relatively poor argument or reason, one that you and I could probably quickly reject. The most common answer they give is, well, the world is so complex that many people rely on God to explain things like biological complexity, things that science can't currently explain. But science is increasingly closing all those gaps of knowledge, pushing God to the margins. Now, I would never say that, although it probably is true to a certain degree. I think the reason that most people believe is fear, fear and indoctrination. But often, that indoctrination is based on fear. I mean, just listen to them. They are terrified of the world that they live in. They're terrified to die. They're afraid of other people. They're afraid of uncomfortable ideas. And they are utterly terrified of themselves. Their gods are all big, scary monsters in the sky that they bow down to out of fear of what would happen to them if they don't. Psalms 11, 110 the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, yada, yada, yada. They live in a world of perpetual fear. And I don't. I just accept reality as it is, whether I like it or not, because what I like doesn't matter. It is what it is. I am not important. And they can't handle that. It's why they are so terrified of everything. But let's continue. This is what is known as a God of the gaps argument, and it is so weak an argument that no serious Christian could rely on it. Except most do. That's the problem. When I talk to the religious, they don't seem to know an awful lot about religion, do they? They don't seem to know what the religious are actually saying, because they've got this idea in their head that doesn't actually hold true in reality. Most theists are using the God of the Gaps argument, at least in some way. Well, I don't understand that, or I don't like that. Therefore, God done it. That's a God of the Gaps argument, and that's what everything in theology is based on. Filling in God as the answer to questions you don't currently have an answer to. But that's not how that works, is it? So, when your atheist friend suggests that it is the strongest reason for belief that he can think of, you can kindly reply saying, Oh, that's the best reason you've encountered? I can think of several better reasons to believe in God than that. For example, and then explain another more powerful argument, like the one further down in this essay. Yeah, we'll get to that. I don't think that any of it is going to work out as you all hope that it will. Yes, I kind of look forward. I have to when I'm doing articles. I don't in videos. Articles are a different matter. But I know what's coming, and I know that it's all ludicrous. I mean, we'll get there. This is just an opening straw man, because I can't imagine that a lot of atheists are actually going to say that. I mean, not well-studied atheists anyhow. But as I said, we'll get there eventually. Let's let them meander on for a while, though. Another strategy is to ask, what would it take for you to believe in God? This question will help reveal whether the person is genuinely open to believing in God or whether he is closed-minded, demanding such an impossibly high standard of evidence. Well, that's what it would take for me. It would take evidence. Got any? I don't mean faith or arguments. I mean actual demonstrable evidence that can be found and evaluated without having to believe in it first or having to hold preconceptions that are not verifiable in the real world. And the answer to that, of course, is no. This whole, well, this will separate those people who are ready to believe from those who aren't, is just stupid. It's the same crap that STR polls. They know that the vast majority of people that their students are going to talk to are just going to laugh because all of the arguments that they've been equipped with are absurdly weak. This is designed to separate the people who actually know what they're talking about from the ones that are going to go, uh, duh, okay, and then just go along with it because the religious are terrified of the first group. When I ask atheists this question, I sometimes hear, well, I guess I'd believe in God if he appeared right in front of me and told me that he existed, or if he wrote something in the stars such as, my name is God and I exist. The problem with answers like this, as you can point out, is that such displays might be surprising and extraordinary, but even if they occurred, 
a skeptic would still find some way to explain them away. And that is true, which is why I don't answer that way. I'll be honest, I don't know what it would take to convince me, because any idea that I've ever come up with, I can imagine non-godly reasons for it. That's not a weakness, that's a strength. It shows that I am looking for the actual truth, not just a comforting fantasy. If your God exists, then he would know what it would take to convince me. Therefore, either God doesn't want me to know he's real, at which point I should just keep doing what I'm doing, or God isn't real, at which point I should just keep doing what I'm doing. There's more, of course, but I'll get to that in a second. For example, maybe the skeptic was just hallucinating when he encountered someone claiming to be God. Or maybe what looked like writing in the stars was actually a light projection from some prankster or government experiment. Experiences like these can always be explained away through natural causes. So, if these are the sort of answers you get, push back a little and suggest we really need a higher and more convincing reason to believe in God, something like a philosophical argument. And then again, present such an argument. The problem with all of this is that the religious don't actually have anything of value to present. When they say, well, what would it take to convince you? They don't have that thing to present no matter what you say. Otherwise, they would have already presented it, and I already believe. None of it matters. Even if I had an example, they couldn't just say, oh, you mean like this, and present whatever I said. Because they don't actually have anything. This is just a distraction from the utter failure on their side. It's a way to say, well, that's just being unreasonable, as if that matters. Unreasonable or not, and I don't think anything is, it would still be what it was going to take for that individual, and in the absence of that evidence, they're just not going to believe. Now that you know, you can safely head for the hills, able to rationalize why you didn't really care if God was real or not. That's just not how any of this works. You need to knock it off. So, anyway, that's where we're going to stop for the day, before we get to his argument. This looks like it's going to be a long one, so uh, be prepared. It'll make the Supercut fans happy, at least, down the line, so uh, there is that. Anyway, what did you think so far? Let me know down in the comments. I come across these How To X articles once in a while, and especially when it comes to converting the unbelievers, they are always really, really dumb. It's like they expect us to be every bit as stupid as the religiously gullible, which we're not, at least by and large. We look at these claims and we just roll our eyes because we know better. We have already studied these things, mostly because we've heard them over and over and over again, and we already have a response. Not that the religious want to hear it, because as we know, they just don't care. They just really want to believe while we don't. We don't have a vested interest in getting to their God like they do. We just want the truth whatever the hell that happens to be. At least, I do, since I don't really want to speak for anyone else. If you want something else, um, let me know that down in the comments too, but I don't think that we're going to get a lot of disagreement on this one, do you? Anyway, I guess we're going to have to see. So, until next time, um, next week, let's just leave it at that. Have fun, and I will see you all for part two. Why is it that the religious have a really hard time actually talking to atheists. Mostly because they have nothing intelligent to say. I keep seeing the religious complain, but you mean, because we don't take their asinine nonsense seriously. But this isn't about being mean, it's about holding to objective reality, and the religious want very little to do with that. So, with that aside, let's get back to it. Welcome back to part two of How to Talk to Atheists with Clarity and Confidence. And if you saw the first part, you know, this isn't about how to talk to actual, real, live atheists. It's about how to make a complete fool of yourself and pander to other theists. And that's pretty typical behavior because up against an actual, well-educated atheist, 
most theists are just toast. They don't actually know nothing. Therefore, they play these silly make-believe games and say, well, we're all going to win, even though anyone who tries just looks silly because these claims and arguments are just dumb. But let's see where this goes next. There's supposedly a big example coming up, and we don't want to miss that, do we? Evidence for God? Someone once asked the 20th century atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell what he would say if he found himself standing before God on Judgment Day, and God asked him, Why didn't you believe in me? Russell replied, I would say, Not enough evidence, God. Not enough evidence. If you hang around skeptics or atheists long enough, you will hear the same response. People are open to believing in God, if only there was enough evidence. And that is true. No one ought to believe anything on insufficient evidence, and sadly for the religious, they just don't have any. Now, they will claim that they do, but it's not the claim that matters, but the demonstration. And when the religious say they've got evidence, what they really mean is, well, we have stuff that we like. It gets them where they want to go, which isn't evidence, it's just confirmation bias. You don't start with the conclusion that you really want to reach and then work backward. You have to start with reality, which is the only thing that we've all concluded is actually there, and then follow the evidence from reality to make conclusions about the real world that fit and make sense. No, the religious don't do that. They start with the things they really want to believe are true, and then say, well, how do we get back to that? Because they can't imagine that the things that they already accept on faith aren't real. This is where just about every single apologist goes wrong, and as we get further into this article, I have a feeling it's going to happen here again, because they just really want to believe. But as we're not starting with the same foregone conclusions, we are not going to take the, but it's just got to be true, as evidence of their claims. They've got to do better than that, and sadly, I think we all know they can't. It doesn't seem to matter how many times we explain the problems to them, they can't get past, but my faith. And this is why these conversations just don't go well. When your friend or family member asserts that there is no evidence for God, do not panic. Believe it or not, they have already taken an important first step. When someone wants proof or evidence before they accept a belief, that's commendable. It means they are not willing to believe something without support. And they shouldn't. Nobody should. But the religious seem willing to do so at the drop of a hat. Why? Because they aren't at all concerned with the facts. They just want the emotional comfort that they derive from their beliefs. Then... They just can't imagine that everyone else isn't just like them, all fifis and no facts, so they just keep repeating the same old tired comforting ideas that they've already been told without realizing that we just don't care about that. We want to see what you can prove, not what you can claim. Now, it's good when the religious recognize that we aren't going to accept anything without corroboration. I mean, neither should they, but it's painfully obvious that they do. They just can't set aside their faith in order to evaluate the claims fairly and rationally. When I say that they don't care, I mean it. Somewhere deep down inside, they might realize that they should care, but when the rubber hits the road, they just don't. Their faith is far too important to them, and that's where they get into trouble. Trying to get them to acknowledge that, that's the real problem, isn't it? We should, however, clarify. What do they mean by evidence? Oftentimes, what people really want is scientific evidence. In the realm of science, evidence refers to data that you can see, hear, taste, touch, or smell. Things that directly confirm or undermine a hypothesis. And in the context of science, such evidence has led to remarkable results. Just look at the advancements in technology and medicine. The problem is that scientific evidence, if you want to call it that, is all that really matters. If God is real, then God must be open to rational evaluation. 
We have never found a single thing that is demonstrably real that cannot be evaluated rationally. The religious, they just don't like that because they've made up an imaginary friend in their heads and now they are trying to tell us that it's real without having any kind of evidence for it whatsoever. They just really want it to be real. How do they know any of that? Well, faith, of course, but faith means absolutely nothing. You can have faith that unicorns are real. Didn't Daniel King's daughter say that in a video a long time ago? That doesn't make them real, of course. It's why faith is such a complete waste of everyone's time. It doesn't matter what you want. It matters what you can prove, and the religious are desperate to avoid having to back up any of it objectively. You have to remember that because of their faith, they have lost any semblance of objectivity. They believe because they want to, not because they have any evidence to support it. How did they get to any of their beliefs? Well, it says so in a book. Or their church told them it was true. Or they were raised from a young age being told these stories. But absolutely none of that makes any of that stuff true. It's why we ask so many questions to get to the core of the matter. In fact, when we ask these questions, they tell us to stop asking because the questions themselves that we ask, they're uncomfortable. They don't want to think about it because thinking about it might make them start to ask questions of their own. And that's pretty dangerous when it comes to religion. It's why we can't stop. It is only through discomfort that they can ever find the truth. Not that they really seem to care. However, scientific evidence isn't the only type of evidence. Many truths that exist, we cannot prove through physical evidence. For instance, we don't have physical evidence that life is meaningful or that murder is wrong. Of course, we understand these statements to be true, but not because we have found physical evidence to support them. We believe these truths on the basis of another sort of evidence. Except we can. What is meaningful is subjective. You make that up yourself. It has no intrinsic meaning. Murder is wrong because humans say that murder is wrong. There is no such thing as objective morality. This is where the religious consistently have problems because they can't separate what they want to be true from what is actually true. But I really like it doesn't matter. And that's what they have a problem with. We don't understand those statements to be true. We've just defined them that way in our heads. This is just bald-faced ignorance on display. And that is nothing to be proud of. The same holds for the existence of God. Whether you believe God exists or not, He is, by definition, immaterial and transcendent. Note that is not how that works. A thing is a thing based on its own demonstrable existence, not something you just make up in your head. If I want to know what a cow looks like, I have to go look at a cow. If I want to know what a god looks like, then I need to be able to go look at a god. Otherwise, any attributes that I arbitrarily assign to it, they're just something that I made up. Now, the religious have been doing this for so long that I don't think they can understand the problem anymore. So, let's continue and see it in action. He is immaterial because he's not composed of physical matter, not made of material stuff like you and me. And God is transcendent because he exists beyond space and time. But how do you know any of that? Not what do you believe, not what do you have faith in. How do you know that that is what your God is actually like? And more importantly, how do you prove it? Because this is where things get tricky. They really like these ideas because they've been thrown around for so many hundreds or thousands of years that none of them even question it anymore. And that's really the problem when you think about it and why it is so important that we ask them these very, very simple questions. How do you know? Well, somebody I trust told me. Okay, how did they know? You need to go back and back and back until they realize that nobody actually knows anything. They believe it, they have faith in it, but they don't know. 
Nobody can know anything because no one has ever had a demonstrable experience with a verifiable God. Well, God just told them. Okay, how do you know that? How do you know they weren't just hearing voices? How do you know they didn't just make it up? Because if you can't answer those questions coherently, you're just wasting everybody's time. Thus, when we're searching for God, we do not expect to find direct physical scientific evidence for his existence within space and time. This fact is important. It is not just that we have not yet found such evidence, although it may exist. It is that such evidence is impossible, even in principle. We are not going to find one of God's hairs, or discover his footprint, or run a scientific experiment to see if he exists. Because that's how your religion has lied to you as a means of keeping you from actually caring about the truth. They are telling you stories that keep you filling the pews and filling the collection plates week after week after week. Because these are all the questions that I had to ask myself when I was deconverting. Where did this information come from and how do I verify it? You can't. That's the problem. Well, it says so in the Bible. How did the people who wrote the Bible know that? God told them. Well, how do you know that? How do you know anything? Those are just meaningless stories that have been passed down for thousands and thousands of years, and they are not open to independent verification. How do you know? And if you realize that you don't, and that's the only answer if you're being honest with yourself, then your journey out of religion is just getting started. Does that mean it is impossible to demonstrate that God exists? No, it simply means that science is not the right means, just as a metal detector is not the right tool to find a wooden cup. We need other tools when exploring non-scientific questions. No, it does mean that it's impossible because demonstrating a real thing, and that's what the religious claim that God is, that does require objective, independent evidence that anyone can evaluate without having to hold all the corroborating beliefs and blind faith first. If you start out believing in a God, then inevitably you're going to see God in everything around you. That's exactly what the religious are doing. It's called confirmation bias. If you start with the belief that God done it, then everything is going to look to you just like God done it. That doesn't mean that God done it. And it's why the evidence has to stack up independently of the beliefs. Look at the trees! is insanely common among the religious belief systems, yet they all insist that their own deity made the trees. Not the others, not the ones that other religions are claiming, only theirs. So how do we prove that it's your god that done it? Good question. They have no good answers. It always comes down to faith, and faith, as we keep saying, Faith means nothing. Otherwise, every religion on the planet, every religion that has ever existed, every religion that will ever exist, all of them must be declared to be true just because all of them have had people who have had faith that they were. Your faith isn't special no matter how much you desperately wish it was. If you're going to be honest, and the religious rarely are, then you've got to be honest for everybody. What other tools are there besides science? One such tool is philosophy. Philosophy is concerned with life's most important issues, from morality to meaning to God. Philosophy allows us to probe realities that can't be detected through our senses. Thus, philosophy provides an excellent method to explore evidence for the existence of God. Except philosophy does not address reality. Sorry. It's conceptual, not physical. You cannot use philosophy to find anything useful about a new species of wombat. It is the wrong tool for the job for anything that you're claiming actually exists. Now, if the religious wanted to say that God is just a concept, fine, I'll agree. Philosophy is a fantastic tool for that, but that's not what they're saying. God isn't just something that lives in their heads. God is supposed to be something that exists in the real world, and we have only one reliable tool for anything that exists in verifiable reality, 
or that interacts with verifiable reality, and that tool is science. In fact, the religious have spent centuries desperately trying to hide God from science. Yeah, look over there! Every time science comes to call. Why? Because they know that science isn't going to find what they desperately want to think is real, so they just make excuses for why science finds nothing, just to get away from the inevitable conclusion that there's no good reason to believe any gods are real in the first place. This is something they cannot accept, and the harder they fight to rationalize and make excuses, the more obvious it is that there's no reason to believe there are any gods out there. Gods are just imaginary. That's what every shred of evidence that we have points to. And it's too bad they'll never accept that, right? Philosophy typically offers evidence in the form of arguments. In fact, thinkers have identified no fewer than 20 arguments for God, arguments that range from the clear and simple to the extremely complex. Some of these arguments appeal to the universe or history, others to the existence of reason and beauty. Except none of that is evidence. That's why they're called arguments, not evidence. This is another problem with the religious, who are just desperately looking for something to call evidence without actually having any evidence. Personal testimony isn't evidence. Philosophy isn't evidence. Only something that you can study independently of your beliefs is evidence, and the religious have none of that. Now, we've examined all the bog-standard philosophical arguments for God, and every single one fails, almost always for the same reason. They are all some variation of, well, I don't get it, therefore God, where God is assumed to be the automatic answer to any question, and when they get stumped, they just slap a God label on it and call it a day. Now, in a second, we're going to see that in action, and I'm going to go into a lot of details on exactly where they get it all wrong. This can be applied to pretty much any so-called argument for God. None of them actually get to God. They just go on for a while and then just say, well, God did it. You can replace God with anything else you want, and it gives you the exact same result. The only way to prove God is to prove God. You can't say God done it without proving that God is real first. Because you have to have a real cause, not just an asserted one. And then you have to produce a direct, demonstrable, causal link between the event in question and the real God that you've already proven. That's it. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time, and wow, do the religious waste a lot of time. So, let's see an example of that coming up shortly. We can approach the God question from many angles, and there is no one best way. However, in this short essay, we are going to look at one of the arguments that I find to be the strongest. The problem is, you can't. Every single angle that they try, that they've ever tried, they are all logically fallacious, which you would think that the uh, so-called philosophers among them would actually understand. But they are entirely blinded when it comes to their faith. There has never been a single convincing argument or claim made for the existence of God, at least as far as I'm concerned, because all of them simply assume the existence of their gods without actually demonstrating the existence of their gods. Assuming things doesn't mean anything. Asserting things doesn't mean anything. You actually have to be able to back it up in a way that I, who am currently not convinced that any of your beliefs are true, can actually accept. I am not biased against your beliefs, I'm just not convinced by them, and the complete inability of the religious to demonstrate any of it, that's just not helping their case. In fact, it just makes them look incompetent. So, here comes the example. We're going to do a very deep dive. A Strong Argument for God before we begin, I want to note that if terms like arguments or evidence disconcert you, you might instead consider these arguments as clues that converge and point to a common conclusion, much the way that road signs guide you to a specific destination. A sign doesn't prove that the destination exists, but it does point the way. These arguments are a signpost for God. 
So let us look at one signpost that, in my opinion, presents perhaps the simplest yet most powerful argument for God's existence. I'm sorry, but if arguments and evidence bothers you, then you've got no business believing any of this stuff because you are terminally stupid. Now, I had just this exact conversation with a theist who said that if I couldn't prove him wrong, then he will continue to believe that he's right because it's my job to prove that God isn't real, not his job to prove that it is. Really, what can you say to that because it's just so painfully stupid and irrational that it warrants no real examination on my side? Ultimately, it went nowhere because for everything that I said, his response was effectively, but God is real, so I'm right. And I just got bored and went somewhere else. My time is a lot more valuable than that. Sadly, that is how most Christians actually operate. They are automatically right because they want to be. Everyone who disagrees with them is automatically wrong because they don't like it. And there's no coherent conversation actually going on. So let's get to his example because it is not good. The Kalam argument dates back to the Middle Ages, but has been made popular today by William Lane Craig, an evangelical Christian philosopher. But the problem is, Craig is an idiot. Like most theists, Craig just wants it to be true, and since he's starting with that conclusion, about which he simply cannot be wrong, he is just jumping to the end result that, of course, he was right all along, without logically proving, well, anything. As I will point out, the Kalam has a lot of problems, the biggest among which is that it doesn't even mention God. It doesn't even attempt to demonstrate God. It doesn't try to link to the Christian God or any other God. It just assumes, well, of course it's God, and just runs around with the goalposts. But that is not impressive. Yet, it doesn't matter how many times we point this out to them, they just keep doing it, because they don't really care about the truth. The argument is very simple. In fact, it is probably the easiest of all the arguments to memorize, having two premises and one conclusion. Premise 1. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise 2. The universe began to exist. Conclusion, the universe has a cause. If you can memorize these three simple statements, you will be well equipped when dialoguing with a skeptic. Yeah, it's clear that this guy is used to talking to idiots, and maybe that's why he thinks that his discussion project is actually working out for the religious. This is kind of like STR, where they're really convinced that their arguments are strong, and then they tell all their students that, uh, yeah, these aren't going to work very often, are they? Because the one thing that they never want to do is talk to somebody who actually has a clue. Now, we've done Kalam to death, and sorry, but we're going to do it again. This time, we're going to point out every single problem that I can see with the religious playbook, and sorry, but I'm probably going to miss some. If you see any that I don't mention, make sure you bring it up down in the comments below. This isn't going to be exhaustive because our theists, they're not being exhaustive, but at least we're going to try. So, I think that's where we're going to stop for the day, just before he gets into his explanations for his premises, because this is going to get really, really, really long if we don't. Next week, we'll just wrap this up with an in-depth look at why all of his claims go absolutely nowhere, which I suppose we all expect, but this is really an example of why the religious don't get on well with the non-religious. We can see right through all of their fallacious behavior, and they sadly can't. They are starting with those emotionally comforting premises that they just happen to like, and really can't understand why everybody else isn't on board, and they're not really open to any explanations that don't include, well, of course we believe, hallelujah. That's the difference. They are looking for belief. They're looking for faith. We are looking for evidence. Our epistemological standards are entirely different from theirs, and ours just so happen to be rational. Theirs aren't. So, we'll be back in a week to finish this up, but I don't think it's going to get any better once they get down to the nitty-gritty. I mean, don't get your hopes up. Stay safe and sane until then, because I'm sure we're going to get a huge laugh. 
The religious clearly don't know how to talk to the non-religious because they assume wrongly that everyone is just like they are. This is something they seem incapable of getting through their heads, and this is why these conversations never go anywhere. It's not us, it's them. So let's see why it all goes so horribly wrong, coming up next. Last time, the article introduced their best argument, and as if it's any surprise, it's the Kalam cosmological argument. And that is ludicrous, we've looked at it before, but we do see a lot of that because people don't actually look at any of these things rationally. So let's do that. Maybe we'll educate the religious on why none of this ever impresses atheists, since this is an article about how to talk to atheists and all, but will it stick? I kind of doubt it, but let's give it a shot anyhow as we finish up this article. So it starts off. Let us unpack each of these three statements. The first premise. This statement says everything that begins to exist has a cause. Sure, and you know why the Kalam was brought up in the first place? Because the regular cosmological argument missed the whole begins to exist bit, and everyone just pointed out that that meant God must have had a cause. So, in the Middle Ages, Islamic scholastic theologians just threw it in there because it solved the problem, at least in their minds. The problem is, they can't show that God didn't begin to exist, because as I've said, they can show nothing at all about their gods. It's just an assertion, and everything that can be asserted without evidence can likewise be dismissed without evidence. I don't care what you believe. I care what you can prove, and they don't like that very much, but oh well. It's very important that we get this right. Some atheists try to refute the Kalam by responding, Ah, oh, well, if everything that exists has a cause, and God exists, then what caused God? But the premise does not claim everything that exists has a cause. It says everything that begins to exist has a cause. And that's the only reason that the Kalam exists at all, to plug that very obvious hole. It doesn't solve their problem, though, since every bit of it is just an arbitrary invention, not a demonstrable reality. I don't accept that your God is the way that you say that it is, until you can demonstrate to my satisfaction that your God is the way that you say it is. If you can define your God however you like, then I can define invisible, intangible, universe-creating pixies however I like, and we go right back to square one. This never goes well, does it? Since God, by definition, and whether you believe in him or not, is eternal and never began to exist, this first premise does not apply to him. Nope. That does not work that way. I have no reason at all to think that your description is accurate. Show me how you came up with your formulation rationally. How do you know that, and how do you prove to me, since you're talking to me, that you actually do? Otherwise, this all just looks like a bunch of wishful thinking, which is actually what it is. Therefore, the rhetorical question, what caused God, is like asking, to whom is the bachelor Mary, or what caused the uncaused thing? Regardless of whether bachelors or uncaused beings exist, these questions do not make sense. They are literally nonsense, because they confuse the meaning of terms. And your God doesn't make sense. That's kind of what the problem of evil proves. But that's another argument, and we're not going to get into that one here. We're not looking for what you want to be the case. We need to see how you reach these conclusions intellectually, and the second that you push faith out the door, the religious have nothing else of consequence to say. That's kind of sad, isn't it? Now that we have cleared away the misunderstanding, let us turn back to the first premise. Yeah, except you didn't. He just pulled the old, well, here's how I define God trick, and I don't care how you define God. I care what you can show is the actual characteristics of a real, demonstrable, defensible deity. Go ahead and do that. 
this is where the conversations start to break down because we have higher expectations and they have nothing at all of consequence to present. It's just what they want to believe and what they want to believe doesn't matter. Is it true? Does everything that begins to exist have a cause? For most people, the answer is yes. It is common sense. No, it's common belief. Just because lots of people believe a thing, that doesn't make that thing true. This is just what religion relies on. Well, we all like it. Okay, big deal. I'm not asking for your opinion. I'm asking for your facts. I want you to prove that the things that you accept on faith actually exist in the real world. Go ahead and do that. They can't, and they don't even try. Kind of sad, huh? Almost nobody denies it. The statement simply means that nothing just springs into existence, randomly and without a cause. For if things did come into being this way, then our world would be a wild spree of things apparently popping into existence like sleight-of-hand magic. See, this is where they're just running on Fifi's and Faith again. They rely on things just being like they are right here and right now, forever and ever and always. Yet, we understand, at least as best as we can, that the physical laws of our particular instantiation of space-time, they came into existence with the Big Bang, along with space and time. So, when they say causality, that means nothing, because we don't have any idea if causality was even a thing before the local physical laws came into existence. Yet they are relying on it because without causality, their entire argument goes right out the window. We have to come back to, well, we don't know. And they are terrified not to know, which is why they just make stuff up. This is why it's really important to understand the ramifications of your arguments. And the religious, they don't care. Only it would be worse, since with sleight of hand, you at least have a magician who pulls rabbits out of a hat. However, in a world that violates this first premise, rabbits would pop in and out of being even without magicians or hats. Few sane people would believe the world works this way. So, through experience and reflection, most people agree that everything that begins to exist has a cause. Except, as we've already shown, the first premise is absolute nonsense without any actual evidence to support it. The second you point that out to the religious, I mean, after their first reaction, which is, duh, they tend to just walk away because they don't even know what to say to that. A lot of them will just go, uh-huh, like little children, because they know very little about actual science and they don't give a crap anyhow. They don't understand that in quantum mechanics, which is the underlying reality behind everything, things do apparently just pop into existence without causes all the time. That's how it works. But of course, we're talking about dumb people who don't know anything, so it's not really a lot of surprise. This is just pure ignorance on display on the part of the religious. No surprise there either. You will also notice something else that's pretty common where he said, well, most people who are in their right mind, in order to say, well, if you don't agree with me, you're insane. This happens all the time, and not just with the religious, with a lot of people, but they will take a position that they are attached to emotionally, and they will just assert that anybody who disagrees, well, they got to be crazy. Except that's not how it works. You have to be able to back up your own statements, and you can't just dismiss anybody who doesn't agree because you don't like it. But this is really, really common, and we need to be able to point that out too. So, the first premise is absolutely defeated, or at the very least, put on hold until they can come up with some actual evidence to support it. And I don't think that they can. So, uh, what else do you got? Well, apparently it's the second premise. This premise says that the universe began to exist. Well, first you would have to define what you mean by the universe, and this is slightly more important than defining what is is. When I talk to most theists, they define the universe as the totality of everything that could even conceivably exist, but that's not the Big Bang. 
our particular instantiation of space-time is a local phenomenon. It seems incredibly massive to us, but in theory at least, it really isn't. Now, we can't see beyond our own particular space-time bubble, so the answer is just, we don't know, and we're back to square one. Yet, it is the religious who are making a positive claim about the universe that they have yet to be able to back up in any demonstrable way. The burden of proof is entirely on their shoulders, not ours. This is why they rely on logical fallacies like argumentum ad populum. Will most people believe it? I don't care what most people believe. I don't care if everyone believes it. Most people, once upon a time, believed that the Earth was flat. That doesn't make it true. Stupid people today still believe it's flat. Still doesn't make it true. You gotta be able to back it up. So, let's continue. This claim is slightly more controversial than the first one. In fact, no less a thinker than St. Thomas Aquinas said that the truth that the world had a beginning of its duration is only conclusively known by faith and not by reason. Nonetheless, a host of the greatest minds from antiquity to the present, including St. Bonaventure of the Middle Ages and William Lane Craig today, <clears throat> okay, right, oh, sorry, 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 offer arguments that purport to defend this truth. Purport, but don't actually. Because they're doing the same things wrong that this dude is. They are starting with a preconceived notion that just has to be true because their faith depends on it, and then they just run around with the goalposts until they get back to their initial assumption. That is not impressive. Notice that he's really impressed with Anselm and Aquinas, things like that, as most Catholics are, but I've never really understood the attraction. Looking at things like Anselm's Five Ways, they are so ludicrous and have been so soundly put to bed that anyone with half a brain cell ought to know better. But this is religion, and I think we all know better than to expect that. An example of one of these arguments, which St. Bonaventure includes in his Paradoxes of the Infinite, goes as follows. If the world has always existed, then there would be an infinite number of past days. However, if there were an infinite number of past days, we would never have been able to arrive at the present day, because an infinite series, by definition, cannot be traversed. Since we have arrived at today, it follows that there must have been a beginning of time. Now, I could talk about the A and B theories of time, but I don't think it really matters. They wouldn't know what the hell we were talking about anyhow. These are not intelligent thoughts regardless. St. Bonaventure lived in the 1200s, which seems to have been when most Catholic thinkers lived, as sad as that is, but we've kind of learned a lot more since then in the past 800 years. Time and knowledge marches on, except for the religious. This isn't rational thought, this is just, well, it seems to me, which is usually the best that they can do. But it doesn't actually demonstrate actual truth. Truth requires evidence, and they have no evidence. It's just another idea they just yanked out of their assholes because it appeals to their none-too-smart believers. And that's not impressive, sorry. Modern physics also seems to give weight to this position. Despite cyclic cosmological models advanced by some physicists in recent years since the advent of the Big Bang Theory in the 20th century, the scientific consensus is that the universe did have a beginning roughly 14 billion years ago. Well, our particular instantiation of space-time, not the entirety of everything that could ever possibly exist. We don't know that. We do know that 13.7 billion years ago, although new information that's just coming out now might suggest it's closer to 26.7 billion, but we're going to kind of set that aside for the moment and give him the 14 billion number is close enough, there was an expansion event from a singularity from which all matter, time, and our physical laws ultimately came. We can say absolutely nothing about what may or may not exist outside the boundaries of our particular bubble of space-time, and neither can they. We can only look at what we see, and the idea in the minds of the religious tends to be very, very simplistic. Alexander Valenkin, a leading non-Christian cosmologist, was invited to speak at a colloquium for Stephen Hawking's 70th birthday. 
There, in front of the greatest scientists in the world, Vilenkin said, all the evidence we have says that the universe had a beginning. It is rare for scientists to speak with this measure of conclusiveness, but Vilenkin stated his opinion that it is not just some of the evidence that points to the beginning of the universe, or even the majority of evidence, but that all of the evidence points that way today. And it does. This is why we need to make sure that our definitions remain very specific and consistent. What Vilenkin meant by universe and what this theist means are probably two very, very different things. Just like what Lawrence Krauss means by nothing and what the religious mean by nothing, those are not remotely alike. It's why you need to define your terms and stick to them and hold everyone else in the conversation accountable so that you're not just talking past each other. And that's what most religious conversations do. They talk past each other because the religious have one set of pre-existing beliefs and science has another. And sadly, we know that the religious aren't that honest about things, which is what makes the extreme measures necessary. Sad, huh? The conclusion of the argument. The two premises are widely accepted today. Everything that begins to exist has a cause, and the universe began to exist. If that is the case, then the third statement, the conclusion of the argument, logically follows. We cannot avoid the fact that if everything begins to exist and it has a cause, and the universe began to exist, then the universe must have had a cause. Except the two premises are only accepted if you're an ignorant theist who just wants to believe, or if you're not talking to actual scientists who are going to quibble on what you mean by your terms. If you're talking about ignorant people with a lot of preconceived notions and blind faith, then sure, they accept those things because it gets them where they desperately want to go. But if you start without any of that, no goal in mind, then you're going to get some very different answers. This is why it matters what your goals are. If you're trying to find comfort, then you're going to come to a very different conclusion than if you're just trying to find the best explanation for things that we have at the moment. And these things are only in the moment because we find out new things about reality all the time. In another 10 years, we might get rid of all of modern cosmology if we discover something better. And that's a scary thought for a lot of people, religious and otherwise, but scary or not, that is how science works. We learn stuff, we revise our ideas, and we keep learning. Lather, rinse, repeat. The religious, by and large, they're looking for a one-size-fits-all, eternal answer that they can rely on forever and ever and ever and always, and that is just not realistic. It's another reason why they can't figure out what they're doing wrong. Because they aren't operating rationally. This logical conclusion leads us to wonder, if the universe had a cause, what is that cause? And, of course, the religious want to tell you exactly what that cause is without having any evidence to prove their claims are true. That's the problem. You don't just get to God done it without being able to prove that God done it. God is not the automatic answer to all questions, so there. Yet that is exactly what the religious assume, isn't it? They just really want it to be God. Therefore, when they have no other emotionally comforting answers, God done it, but that doesn't mean that God done it. And this is really the problem with this argument. It doesn't mention gods at all. It says a cause. What is that cause? Who knows? Big deal. Even if it had a cause and it was completely natural, that doesn't get them anywhere. But they don't want to talk about that, do they? They don't know and they don't care, and if you push them, they'll just disengage and run away, which I guess is both sad and funny at the same time. Don't let them gish gallop their god into the mix. Make them prove it. It's kind of funny to watch them try. The cause certainly could not have been anything within the universe, or even the universe itself, since things can't cause themselves to come into existence. This idea defies logic. No, it really doesn't. It only defies your limited view of what reality could be. That view is caused by the beliefs that are polluting your mind. It's why we have to point out all the places that they're going wrong, 
Not that they will really care. They just really wish it was true, but wishing doesn't mean anything, does it? It would be like saying your arm caused you to come into existence, or that you yourself are the cause of your own existence. Neither statement could be true, for since before you existed, there was no arm and there was no you. So the religious just make up an explanation that they really like and find emotionally comforting. Different religions have different solutions, none of which have any evidence to back them up. In fact, the religious go to extreme lengths to explain why and to hide their imaginary friends from rational evaluation. Because this isn't about truth, it never has been. It's about fee-fees. It's about really wanting an imaginary father figure in the sky to watch over them and take care of them and explain all the things that they just can't find easy answers to any other way. But that doesn't make any of it true. And it's the truth, the actual truth, the demonstrable truth that matters. Don't let them get away with it. Hold their feet to the fire and demand to know how they know the things that they claim to know. Because their faith means nothing. Faith is just an omission of failure. Where is your evidence? Don't be surprised when they have none. Thus, the cause of the universe must be something beyond the universe, something beyond all matter, energy, space, and time. In other words, it must be transcendent beyond the universe. It must be immaterial beyond matter and space. It must be eternal beyond time. And if it has created something so massively complex as the universe, it must be tremendously powerful and intelligent. Well, a transcendent, immaterial, eternal, supremely powerful, and intelligent cause of the universe, what does that sound like to you? As Thomas Aquinas pithily put it, this sounds like what most people mean by God. But that doesn't make it God. That doesn't make it a God, and it certainly doesn't make it your God. This is just, but it sounds good to me, which is absolutely stupid. See, this is why having conversations with these people is so absurdly awful. They are not being intelligent. They are being emotional. They really wish that these things were true, no evidence or anything, just wishful thinking and blind faith, and the second that we don't take either of those things seriously, they get upset. They can't understand why we don't accept their faith as valid. But they don't accept the faith of other religions as valid, so it all becomes ridiculously hypocritical. We are not trying to get to comfort here. We are trying to get to truth. Well, it sounds like God to me doesn't mean anything. It just sounds like delusion to me. Now, can we get off the childish faith train and try to find some common ground in the real world, please? They can't, which is why these conversations never go anywhere. Now, this philosophical proof for God is fairly abstract. It doesn't generate the warm personal faith you might receive in prayer. And it doesn't prove the fullness of God, especially those facts we know only because God has revealed them to us, such as that God is love or is a trinity of persons. Well, first off, it's not abstract, it's delusional, because we can do the exact same thing they're doing. Well, it sounds like invisible, intangible, universe-creating pixies to me. Great, where does that get us? Nowhere. Nowhere at all. I don't care what you think. I care what you can prove. I care what we can show is actually going on in the real world, and that's where the rational and the religious part weighs. That's why when I say I want to talk to a rational theist, I mean I want to talk to a theist who isn't relying on faith or fifis at all. Faith and fifis mean nothing. Get me one of those because I have never seen one in my life and I don't think I ever will. I don't care what you want. I don't care what you like. I don't care what you feel. I don't care about any of that. I don't care about you as an individual, at all. I care what is going on in the real world beyond any individual or group of people. I don't care what's in your head. I care what's in reality, and the religious are simply not concerned. 
That's why I say that if there is a good God out there, I want to know about it. And if there's an evil God, I want to know about that too. If there's no God, I want to know that. I don't care how it makes me feel. I care about what is actually real. And that is something that I have never seen once, not ever, not at all, found with a religious person. My feelings don't matter any more than yours do. It's time to grow up and deal with the reality. Enough with the childish emotions already. However, the Kalam argument does give us a sign pointing in the right direction. Although not everyone will accept it, the Kalam argument is a rationally well-constructed and impressive argument that will be difficult for most atheists to reject. So commit right now to memorizing these three simple statements. And we're not going to go through that again. You notice the one thing that the actual Kalam never did though, right? It never mentioned any gods at all. Not the Christian God, not any God, period. It just says, well, it came from somewhere. Okay, where? Who knows? The argument never addresses that. That's why the Kalam doesn't actually mean anything, and the religious just have to tack their imaginary friend on the end because, well, it sounds good to me. But that's still stupid. It really is. I just had someone in a video that went up today as I'm writing this, say that he's never made contact with a god, angels, or demons because Christianity is a con job. So when I was telling you about that video in the comments way back then, this is the video I was talking about. Anyway, thanks for that conversation, Clem Stevenson. But he's right. It's all a gigantic con job that nobody can independently justify. And the people who ought to know better, the ones who have studied the religion and ought to know what a load of nonsense it is, they are stuck believing because they've been bamboozled by the bullshit. It's why all of their beliefs are so easy to take apart because they are never based on logic, reason, evidence, or critical thinking in the first place. They just really want to believe. And that's really, really dumb. So anyhow, that took way longer than I thought it would. The more that I dive into these, the longer it takes because the nonsense is just packed in so tight and you just have to stop and address it and that takes time. I honestly didn't know that this was going to take a full three videos to get through, but I guess that's what supercuts are for, right? Eventually, I'll make it down to this one and people can just watch it in all of its, hell, I don't even know how long it's going to be in the end, but in all of its extended glory. So anyway, what did you think? I'd really love to hear from Christians, although I doubt that I will, because most of them are terrified to speak up. They are trapped in their own echo chambers where asking any difficult questions sends you straight to hell, and that's just the most absurd thing ever. Well, don't ask questions or you're going to fry. Do you know just how dumb that sounds? Because you should. Everybody should. It's just a way to keep you addicted because it's that addiction that keeps the church making money. It's a rational death spiral, and you're the one paying the cost as the church gets rich. This is not something that you should do, at least not until you're intellectually convinced with good evidence to back it up, that any of this is actually true. I honestly don't think you can get there. I mean, I know I couldn't once I started asking questions and thousands and thousands and thousands of atheists can back me up on that. It's once you understand where they're going wrong, and they are going wrong a lot, that you can start to see that there's no reason to believe any of it at all. Come on over to the dark side. At least we've got cookies.